It's no secret by now that I absolutely adore walking with dinosaurs. This series has had such an impact on my love and fascination for prehistoric animals and the natural history of our world, and the way it portrays these ancient animals living out their lives and behaving in realistic ways is just fantastic. This series really was something unique, undoubtedly inspiring a new generation of paleontologists and increasing public interest in our planet's past. Overall, it was absolutely a very good thing. But considering this series is now 24 years old, it's no surprise that it's a little bit outdated. The science of paleontology progresses at an astonishing rate, with our understanding of dinosaur paleobiology having advanced significantly over the last couple of decades. Plus, walking with dinosaurs does have somewhat of a reputation for making some fairly controversial and unusual decisions when it comes to a few of the animals featured. So, looking back on this wonderful show 24 years later, what did Walking with Dinosaurs get right, and what did it get wrong? That's what we've been exploring in this video series, and this time we're going to be taking a look at the fifth episode, Spirits of the Ice Forest. This is a particularly interesting episode, portraying life in Antarctica during the early Cretaceous and the extreme conditions that non-avian dinosaurs and other animals had to endure to survive here. Some very unique and memorable organisms are featured, especially the giant temnospondyl amphibian Coolosuchus, which is actually kinda terrifying in this episode, and there's a lot to say about the animals they chose to include and how they're portrayed. So let's get into it. What are the scientific accuracies and inaccuracies of spirits of the ice forest? We'll begin with the central focus of this episode, Lielinosaurus. This was a small kind of ornithischian, potentially an ornithopod, although its exact classification is not agreed upon, and was first named in 1989. Well, as we found is often the case with the species featured in Walking with Dinosaurs, one of the first things that's wrong about this dinosaur's depiction is the time in which it's shown to have lived. The episode states that these events took place 106 million years ago, putting it in the middle of the Albion stage of the Cretaceous. However, Lielinosaurus is only known from fossils dating to the early Albion, about 113 to 110 million years ago. Strangely enough, the formation this episode appears to be based on, the Eumerella Formation famously exposed at Dinosaur Cove in Victoria, Australia, is therefore labelled the completely wrong time, as well as being stated to be on the wrong continent. Although Australia, New Zealand, and Antarctica were of course still connected at this time in the Cretaceous, the Eumerella formation itself is restricted to Australia, so really the episode should probably be considered to take place here instead, though apparently the companion book does state that it's set in the Australian Antarctic Rift Valley. Anyway, moving on to the life appearance of the dinosaurs themselves, one of the most notable things that might strike you as someone looking back on this series from the 2020s is the distinct lack of any sort of feathery integument. Now, to be fair, it's still somewhat reasonable at the moment to argue that ornithopods such as Lielinosaura could have retained primarily scaly integument, as there's no direct evidence for feathers or protofeathers in this animal. However, considering the 2014 description of the basal neonithiscian Colindodromius, which preserved clear evidence of a feathery skin covering, it suggests that such integument was ancestral to these animals and potentially dinosaurs as a whole, and therefore dinosaurs such as Lielinosaura could have been covered in a fluffy coat of feather-like structures. Although there is some debate as to exactly how cold the polar regions of the Cretaceous got, which we'll come back to later, there's no doubt that the climate these animals lived in was still cold, and therefore a thick coating of filamentous integument to aid in insulating such a small-bodied dinosaur is entirely reasonable, and indeed has become the norm in most recent reconstructions of Leonosaura. Of course, back in the 90s people were still getting used to feathering theropods, never mind ornithischians, with the good evidence for such a widespread occurrence of this integument type not appearing for quite some time after this series was made. One of the other key things that's potentially not quite right with these Lielinosaurus models in this episode is the length of their tails. Work done by a paleontologist in 2009 concluded that two specimens of articulated body fossils could be referred to this species and therefore give us a better understanding of what the body of Lielinosaurus looked like since the holotype specimen is only a part of a skull. This work found that the referred specimens actually preserved evidence of an enormously long tail, with more than 70 individual vertebrae comprising the tails of these dinosaurs, making the tail up to three times as long as the body. Additionally, there were no ossified tendons present in these appendages, structures that support and increase rigidity in other ornithischian tails, with expanded processes of the vertebrae only giving the tail rigidity in the posterior half. Therefore, this has led to suggestions that Lianosaura potentially had a very flexible tail. The function of such a flexible tail is unclear, but some people have entertained the idea that, if it were covered in fluffy integument, the dinosaur could then use it to wrap around itself to keep warm while sleeping or resting, 
Obviously, there's no way to prove they engaged in such behaviour with any degree of certainty, but it is an absolutely adorable idea and I want it to be true. Other ideas have proposed that the long tails were used for communication, another interesting but unsupported suggestion. Sadly, later work by the same paleontologist in 2013 actually found that he couldn't confidently assign the other two specimens to Lielinosaurus after all, as the stratigraphy of the site they came from was reassessed. Therefore, Lielinosaurus is possibly still only known from skull material, in which case the anatomy of its tail remains unknown for now. There's still a chance that the long-tailed specimens could belong to Lielinosaurus though, and indeed work from 2017 seems to have reassigned the long-tailed specimen to the dinosaur, but there's still some question as to their identity. So, long-tailed Lianosaurus reconstructions are probably plausible as far as our current understanding goes, but the lack of such elongated structures in the Walking with Dinosaurs models is excusable. The relatively large eyes of Lianosaurus compared to the size of its head does make sense for the inferred behaviour portrayed in this episode, enabling the animals to see better in low light levels and search for food. This is based on the initial descriptive work of Lianosaurus in 1989, which stated that the animal possessed enlarged optic lobes in the brain case as well as large orbits for the eyes, indicating an enhanced visual acuity in this dinosaur. However, later work attributed these features to the fact that the Lianosaurus specimen they are present in was probably a juvenile individual that was not fully grown at the time of its death. Since juveniles of many vertebrates have proportionally larger heads and eyes compared to adults of the same species, these enlarged eyes might not be an indication of an adaptation for a heightened sense of sight. Still though, these dinosaurs would have had to endure long periods of darkness during the winter months living at this latitude, assuming they didn't migrate, and so larger eyes and good low light eyesight does make sense for such animals. Work from 2017 actually used synchrotron scans to reconstruct the internal anatomy of the skull of the dinosaur and also found evidence to suggest Lianosaurus had good vision. The depiction in the episode of large eyes is therefore again not a bad detail in this model, but the evidence supporting it has been contested. Something that I neglected to discuss in previous episodes though, and which applies to Lianosaurus, is the issue of cheeks in Ornithischian dinosaurs. This is an interesting debate that has been researched a fair bit, with paleontologists for a long time considering cheeks to probably be present in most Ornithischian dinosaurs. A covering over the sides of the mouth makes sense for herbivorous animals processing lots of plant matter as it helps to keep the food contained as it's chewed, and evidence from the relatively inset position of the cheek teeth of many Ornithischians, with an overhanging maxilla and large dentary, made it seem quite plausible that a cheek-like soft tissue structure might have stretched between the lower and upper jaws. Plus, the presence of small holes called foramina along the margins of the jawbones were considered to be evidence of neurovascular structures that nourished the cheeks and supplied them with blood. However, research published in 2018 investigated whether or not many groups of Ornithischian dinosaurs would actually have possessed such structures, finding that the structure of so-called cheeks in these animals would have looked quite different to what we had imagined. Instead of having a mammal-like arrangement of muscle fibres directed straight down from an attachment ridge on the upper jaw to the lower jaw, Ornithischians were more likely to have a sort of forward-extending fan of muscle that attached to the lower jaw at one end and to the cranium at the other, underneath the flaring jugal, or cheekbone. So, truly muscular cheeks in these dinosaurs that cover the entire extent of the back part of the mouth don't seem likely. However, the paper doesn't rule out the possibility that thinner, non-muscular cheek analogues could have been present, as again such structures make sense to keep food contained within the mouth. The cheeks in the Lielinosaurus reconstructions in the show, then, probably shouldn't look like this. Although, to be fair, the 2018 study mainly focuses on more derived groups of Ornithischians. But still, the Lielinosaurus cheeks should probably be placed further back and shaped differently, and perhaps be thinner. But this is a pretty contentious and uncertain aspect of dinosaur reconstructions, and you see a lot of variation in modern paleo art. The overall depiction of Lielinosaurus in this episode again suffers from many of the common issues with the dinosaurs in the series as a whole that we've discussed plenty of times before. Most of these are simply a result of the trends and paleontological knowledge of the time though. And overall the design does look really nice, and like most depictions in the show has created an iconic look for the animal. However, there are still things that don't look quite right. There's quite a bit of shrink wrapping in the design, especially in the head where the borders of the orbits are clearly visible, and the neck just looks far too thin in some shots. The models just seem like they need significantly beefing up with soft tissue to make them look a little more realistic and like actual animals, especially if they're animals that survived months of polar darkness and cold. It would have been kinda cool to see these dinosaurs putting on some weight as they prepared for the winter and built up fat stores to sustain them, an idea that some paleontologists have also suggested as a possibility. Nevertheless, there are still some really nice little bits of attention to detail in the designs. For example, in the physical Lielinosaurus puppets used in this episode, you can see a covering of small rounded structures all across their skin. I don't think they're meant to be osteoderms or anything, as these aren't known from ornithopods, 
but they do add a nice, unique texture to the skin and give the creatures a distinctive look. Just a nice bit of hypothetical integument detail. The shape of the head in these models does also seem to be a little bit off, just looking a little too short front to back, when really Lielanosaura has a bit more of an elongated skull. This stout looking head is perhaps the result of Lielanosaura initially being classified as a Hypsilophodontid dinosaur, and the show therefore basing the head shape off of Hypsilophodon or a related dinosaur. Additionally, the position of the external ear opening in the model is possibly a little too high up on the skull, but that's a very minor nitpick and it's mostly in the right area. The coloration of the animals helping to camouflage the dinosaurs is a nice detail too, with patterns that break up their outlines and some countershading being employed. This seems like a pretty reasonable colour scheme for a small herbivore inhabiting a forested region, and indeed the discovery of countershading present in the Ceratopsian Cetacosaurus, which was a small herbivore and an inhabitant of forests, proves that this is a suitable look for such reconstructions. A range of interesting yet speculative behaviours are also portrayed in the Lielanosaura in this episode, which, while obviously there's not exactly much in the way of direct fossil evidence for them, do add a sense of realism to these dinosaurs as actual animals going about their daily lives, which is always a welcome way of showing prehistoric organisms. A very strict social order among these dinosaurs is described in this episode, with a dominant breeding pair leading the clan of Lielanosaura. The fact that there are also individuals acting as sentries within the group to look out for and signal the presence of danger obviously brings to mind the social structure of modern mammals such as meerkats, which seem to have served as inspiration for the group interactions of Lielanosaura. The conflicts between clans as they compete for territory and access to food sources is again another behaviour observed in meerkats and other social mammals. Clearly then, the social behaviour of these dinosaurs seems to be based heavily on mammalian behaviours. Since these types of social organisations aren't actually seen in modern reptiles, there's not exactly any reason to think that this exact social structure was particularly likely to be present in non-avian dinosaurs such as their species. On the other hand, there's also not necessarily any evidence suggesting against it, at least not in Lielanosaura. Additionally, some modern species of birds can have fairly complex group organisations in cases where individuals aggregate, and of course many species are actually monogamous and mate for life, or at least establish long-term breeding pairs. So the breeding pair behaviour shown in the non-avian dinosaurs in this episode is probably plausible and is a nice detail to include, as is the competition between the males after the dominant female is killed, since all kinds of modern birds and other animals engage in such displays. Some evidence that could be taken as supporting social living as shown in the episode is explained in the accompanying Walking with Dinosaurs The Evidence book, in which it's said that the presence of many potential Leonosaur fossils from Dinosaur Cove, a lot of which seem to possibly come from juvenile individuals, suggests group living in this area. Plus, there are fossil trackways known from other parts of the world that record several small ornithopods all travelling together in the same direction, hinting at a social way of life. Another argument put forward in the book is the fact that small ornithopod fossils are often found associated with others, such as what's seen in the Hypsilophodon beds on the Isle of Wight in England, suggesting that these animals were all together when they died. Other pretty cool little bits of behaviour shown for these dinosaurs include the construction of decoy nests to distract potential predators from the places where their eggs are kept, a behaviour that's actually seen in living reptiles such as some turtles and birds. Then there's also the defence strategy seen as one of the Lielanosaurus scrapes up dirt into the face of the Steropodon that's trying to steal its eggs. It looks hilarious, but does also make me feel kinda bad for the Kawati Mundi they used to live act it, which presumably just had a load of dirt chucked in its face by the film crew. There's also the scene in which the little dinosaurs are forced to undergo a group torpor during the coldest part of winter. Though they're generally active throughout the winter months, the narration explains that this is sort of a last resort to cope with extreme temperatures, and that they can't last more than a couple of days in a state. There's an interesting reference to a hypsilophodontid dinosaur bone that comes from 3 metres above a sedimentary structure in a rock sequence that indicates frozen ground, which doesn't show any sign of slowed growth, basically meaning that this small neonithiscian would still have been active during the cold winter months. So, based on the evidence of this possible relative of Lielanosaura not undergoing long periods of torpor, the depiction of this behaviour being a last resort that only lasts a couple of days seems fairly reasonable. From what we currently understand of these dinosaurs, it seems that they were indeed active during the dark months, and short periods of torpor would have been rare. Moving on to one of the other animals seen in this episode, what did they get right and wrong about Coolasuchus? Coolasuchus is a type of amphibian called a Temnospondyl, an ancient grouping of tetrapods that ranged from the Carboniferous until the Cretaceous period. These animals are not closely related to modern amphibians, however, as all living representatives actually belong to a different clade called Lysamphibia, although there have been some suggestions that Lysamphibians actually derived from Temnospondyls, 
Coolasuchus itself is, interestingly, actually the last known member of the Temnospondyls to have existed, with the disappearance of this taxon marking the extinction of the entire order. Well, possibly, unless Les Amphibians evolved from them. Once again, this animal is apparently time-travelling in this episode, since Coolasuchus is known from fossils dating to the older Aptian stage of the early Cretaceous, putting it at around 120 million years old. The fact that this episode occurs 106 million years ago in the Albion stage, then, means walking with dinosaurs apparently extended the range of the Temnospondyls another 14 million years or so. Anyway, the reconstruction of this organism in the episode is obviously incredibly iconic, and has created an instantly recognisable look that has undoubtedly influenced many others since. The design definitely invokes a very tadpole-like image of the creature, which is a cool detail since one of the discoverers of the animal apparently compared its structure to being somewhat like that of a tadpole. It was also actually named in 1997, only two years before the release of Walking with Dinosaurs. Considering that Coolasuchus is not known from the best fossil material, with some mandibles, skull fragments, and a few bones from the body having been found, the life appearance of this particular Temnospondyl is largely based on comparisons to related taxa. Since it is a member of the Temnospondyl family Chigutisauridae, which also includes some better represented animals such as Ciderops that has an almost complete skull preserved, it seems that these other amphibians were probably used to base walking with dinosaurs design on. The overall shape of the skull, being very broad and actually wider than the rest of the body, is pretty good in this design, and the eyes are positioned on the top of the skull as they should be. This episode also shows Coolasuchus walking on land, something that would presumably have been possible for this animal, although it wouldn't have been a particularly graceful ordeal. A fossil trackway from the early Jurassic of Southern Africa that was likely made by a Temnospondyl walking on land gives us an idea of how this would have been achieved by these organisms, being very sprawled and close to the ground and using the ends of their digits to drag themselves along. It also seems as though the forelimbs were used as the main source of propulsion when on land, which makes sense considering the large heads of these animals would have shifted their centre of mass significantly more towards the front. The episode shows this kind of terrestrial locomotion pretty well, though it might be slightly too much like a salamander, which used their hind limbs when walking a bit more than Temnospondyls are thought to have done. Coolasuchus is portrayed as an ambush predator in this episode, and also as an opportunistic scavenger feeding on a dead Leonosaura. The dentition of Coolasuchus does indeed suggest a carnivorous diet, and the argument has been made in studies on certain Mesozoic Temnospondyls, including Coolasuchus, that since they superficially resemble modern crocodilians in some ways, they might therefore have had a similar lifestyle. Some researchers have also suggested that certain Temnospondyls might have competed with crocodilians for food and resources, again indicating a crocodilian-like ecology. So the portrayal of Coolasuchus as an ambush predator waiting just below the waterline for prey to come close is consistent with current ideas about its lifestyle. The placement of the eyes at the front and on the top of the head is another adaptation that would support such behaviour, as does the presence of sensory canals on the animal's skull bones, which likely enabled them to pick up vibrations in the water. This also leads into the episode's narration about how the Temnospondyls elsewhere have gone extinct due to crocodilians. Eventually being outcompeted by crocodilomorphs once warmer aquatic fauna reached the region is given as a potential cause of the Temnospondyls' ultimate extinction in the paper naming Coolasuchus, so it's reasonable that walking with dinosaurs would suggest this as a reason for their disappearance, although other factors likely played a role too. Coolasuchus is shown as hibernating during the winter months in this episode too, moving back and forth from the forest to the open river systems. Well, considering it's an amphibian, and amphibians don't technically hibernate, really they should have used the term brumation, a state of torpor and inactivity during the winter in ectothermic animals. There is actually evidence of Mesozoic Temnospondyls undergoing such annual periods of inactivity, presumably in order to survive the unfavourable seasonal conditions, as seen in thin sections taken of their bones. These sections show a complete stop to any bone deposition for a period of time, showing that the animals regularly shut their metabolic activity down. Considering that Coolasuchus lived near to the South Pole at this time, it therefore makes sense to assume that it likely would have undergone brumation in order to survive the cold winter months too, so this seems like a pretty accurate depiction for the episode. So, Coolasuchus makes a fantastic and iconic addition to the show, and based on the limited material we have from it at the moment, it seems to be a pretty decent depiction of this organism. It's also great to have some Temnospondyl representation in a documentary. They're not exactly featured in things like this very often, and bringing more attention to this fascinating group of animals is always going to be a good thing. One of the other dinosaur stars of this episode is the wonderfully bizarre Mutabarasaurus. Named for the town in Queensland near where the first remains were discovered, the anatomy and evolution of this dinosaur are actually incredibly interesting. 
Although when it was first described in 1981, it was classified as an iguanodontid, meaning it was considered to be very closely related to iguanodon from Europe, later research published in 1996 by the same author who initially named it, found that it more likely represented something very different. Instead of being an iguanodontid, it was positioned more basally, representing a lineage that split off prior to other lineages of non-iguanodontids. Basically, all this means that despite many reconstructions of the animal, including the walking with dinosaurs one to an extent, making this dinosaur look like an Australian version of Iguanodon, it was really quite different. Amazingly, Mutabarasaurus is actually in the correct time period for this episode, being known from two different times in the Albion stage that would infer it was alive 106 million years ago, when this episode is set. The life appearance of the animal in this episode is definitely very much inspired by Iguanodontians. The most notable feature of the design is of course the inflatable nasal resonating chamber that they utilise in order to amplify their calls to one another. The presence of this structure is based on the skull anatomy, which shows that Mutabarasaurus possessed an inflated nose bump. Although the presence of soft tissue structures that could be inflated to amplify their vocalisations, as shown in the episode, cannot be proved, it doesn't seem like an unreasonable speculation. Indeed, the bony nasal bulla, as it has been termed, does seem to have been hollow, and the fact that an older specimen of Mutabarasaurus, which likely represents a different species to the original material, seems to have had a slightly differently shaped nasal bulla, might be a sign that they were utilised as sexual display structures. Perhaps, as in crested hadrosaurs, these structures were indicators of fitness and helped in finding mates. Again, it's all largely speculation, and the function shown in Walking with Dinosaurs doesn't seem too unreasonable based on what we know. The back of the skull of Mutabarasaurus is quite notably wide, too with the postorbital bar being very broad, perhaps helping in dispersing stresses involved with eating. The walking with dinosaurs design does seem to incorporate this part of the anatomy quite nicely, with front views of the dinosaur clearly showing the back of the head to be very wide. Mutabarasaurus is shown to possess a thumb spike on its hands in this episode, reminiscent of the famous Iguanodon. This is definitely coming from the initial ideas about this dinosaur being an Iguanodontid, however in the 1996 work re-evaluating this animal, it was argued that Mutabarasaurus actually would not have had such a structure on its hands. So that's definitely an outdated part of this design. Another outdated feature of Mutabarasaurus in this episode that we now understand to be incorrect, is the way in which it's shown walking. Although they're shown to sometimes walk bipedally, they also switch to being quadrupedal at times, again as Iguanodonts are thought to have been able to do. However, with the position of Mutabarasaurus now being more basal, it seems probable that these dinosaurs were incapable of walking quadrupedally, instead being obligate bipeds. The weight of these animals is given in the episode as 3 tons, and that's probably about right, with estimates done by paleontologist Greg Paul putting Mutabarasaurus at 2.8 metric tons. Ironically, despite the majority of animals throughout Walking with Dinosaurs suffering from the shrink wrapping effect that was common in reconstructions of the time, in which too little extra soft tissue is added to the skeleton, making them look more skinny than they should be, Mutabarasaurus suffers from the opposite problem. Since it has now been reclassified outside of the iguanodontid group, instead being considered by most workers to belong to a grouping called the Rhabdodontomorphs, the Mutabarasaurus design here is actually a little too robust, and it should instead be reconstructed as a more gracile animal. The cheeks of this Mutabarasaurus design also fall into the same issue as other Ornithischian dinosaurs in the show, and look a little too mammal-like. They seem to be very muscular in their construction, and also go right up to the keratinous beak, which, as I explained before, is still somewhat of a contentious topic. Mutabarasaurus is also portrayed in this episode as a migratory animal, heading south in the summer and then back north again in wintertime. Well, obviously this is very speculative and not much can really be said about the plausibility of this behaviour. However, as pointed out in the accompanying Walking with Dinosaurs The Evidence book, the fact that remains attributed to this genus have been found in Queensland as well as New South Wales, could infer that they migrated across great distances. But that can't exactly be proved very easily. It's also not actually known from as far south as other animals featured in this episode, such as Leonosaurus. Plus, of course, it's from a completely different formation anyway. The diet of Mutabarasaurus is shown in this episode as consisting of quite tough plant matter, and although the exact food items these dinosaurs fed on cannot be determined for certain based on the remains we currently have, there are some quite fascinating features of this dinosaur's anatomy relating to its feeding mechanics. Instead of having teeth and jaws like an iguanodon and the hadrosaurs, which were suited for chewing motions, Mutabarasaurus had teeth that would have acted more like shears, with a single cutting edge to the teeth. This dentition is actually much more like what's seen in Ceratopsians, the horned dinosaurs, and not other ornithopods, a remarkable instance of convergent evolution, 
Interestingly, when Mutabarasaurus was first discovered, it was actually suggested that it may have been partially carnivorous, due to the shearing action of the teeth, plus the broad area at the back of the skull likely providing an increased attachment point for large jaw muscles. But this is no longer thought likely. Instead, the larger muscles probably would have just allowed it to process tough plant matter, driving the shearing teeth through vegetation. So, Mutabarasaurus really is a remarkable dinosaur, and I hope more research gets done on it soon, especially considering that it seems like a second species is out there and needs naming. Once again, Walking with Dinosaurs has done a great job of bringing attention to a relatively obscure dinosaur, and created an iconic look for it. And although there are of course some outdated parts to the design, overall it's not too bad. Next up, we have the final dinosaur featured in the episode, the so-called Polar Allosaur. The story behind this animal being included in the episode is quite interesting, as the basis for the reconstruction is actually just a single bone. This bone, an ankle bone called the Astragalus, was described in 1981 and came from the early Cretaceous of Victoria. This bone was thought to look very similar to the Astragalus of Allosaurus from the Jurassic of North America, and so it was described as representing a new early Cretaceous species of Allosaurus itself. It appeared to be smaller than the older Allosaurus species, so the researchers considered it to be a dwarf species of the dinosaur and suggested that maybe similar Allosaurus species survived on into the Cretaceous in the polar forests of Australia. So this is the idea that Walking with Dinosaurs went with, labelling the theropod as a polar Allosaur. But of course, claiming that a new species of an already named large theropod exists in a completely different time period on a separate continent is probably going to attract some controversy. And that's exactly what happened. Later researchers variously argued that the Astragalus belonged to an Ornithomimid, then an Abelisauroid, and then it went back to an Allosauroid, but not Allosaurus specifically. The most recent analysis of the bone classifies it as a Megaraptorid, a grouping of theropods that themselves have a particularly contentious classification. Apparently in later Walking with Dinosaurs media, including on the old BBC website, the polar Allosaur was labelled as Australovenator instead, once that had been officially described in 2009. Indeed, the astragalus bone was tentatively referred to Australovenator most recently, as this dinosaur is a kind of Megaraptorid, so it's possible to just consider the polar allosaur as representing Australovenator in this episode. If we are to do that, however, it then makes this reconstruction very inaccurate. It's clear that once again, the actual design is just a differently coloured reuse of the Allosaurus and Eustreptospondylus models from episodes 2 and 3, and considering that at the time the show was being made, the polar allosaur idea seemed reasonable, that's fair enough. But Australovenator is quite a unique theropod. Being called the cheetah of its time by the paleontologists who worked on it, this dinosaur had a fairly gracile skull and small teeth, but relatively long arms that, based on later studies, turned out to have actually been incredibly flexible and were probably used as the main way this animal captured prey. Another study also noted the possibility that Australovenator employed its hind feet in dispatching prey, as they noticed a pathology that might have been caused by the theropod kicking at prey items. So yeah, if we want to think of the theropod in this episode as Australovenator, it's just going to look very different overall, and likely behave differently too when it's hunting, probably using its arms and legs more than its mouth, instead of what's shown here. A nice little bit of behavioural detail shown in the episode happens when there's a confrontation between two of these theropods over the carcass of a Mutabarasaurus. Instead of an outright fight between the individuals, there's simply some threatening behaviour and warning vocalisations, portraying a very realistic interaction between animals. Instead of risking injury by physically engaging each other, both theropods avoid this and seem very cautious. Just another small detail that illustrates how great Walking with Dinosaurs is at showing these creatures as real animals. And that covers all the main animals featured in the episode. However, there are also a few creatures briefly shown in this episode that are worth talking about too. The first of these are the pterosaurs shown flying over the forest. They're only seen from a distance and just look like some kind of generic pterodactyloid or pteranodontoid, and there's probably a reason for that. Pterosaur remains from Australia have always been extremely rare, and it's only relatively recently that these animals have started to be named from here. Many of these pterosaur fossils have come from the Tulabuck Formation of Queensland, including a lower jaw that was first reported in 1980. This specimen was for a while considered to be very similar to the genus Ornithochirus from the UK, and at certain times in the years since its initial report has been assigned to this genus. Other pterosaur researchers disagreed though, and its classification was moved around quite a bit until 2011, when it was named as a new genus and species of pterosaur, Aussie Draco Molnari. This lower jaw is mentioned in the accompanying Walking with Dinosaurs the Evidence book, along with a few other isolated fossils from the formation, and so we can assume that the material eventually named as Aussie Draco formed part of the basis for the pterosaurs in this episode. Aussie Draco is now classified as a member of Targaryen Draconidae, a grouping of Ornithochiron pterosaurs named for House Targaryen, 
but back when Walking with Dinosaurs was being created, it still seemed as though it might have represented a very close relative of Ornithochirus. The narration suggests that these are migratory animals heading south for the summer, which again is entirely speculative but not unreasonable considering that certain birds today will fly great distances as the seasons change. Not a lot can really be said about the design, especially since Aussie Draco is still only known from that jaw fragment, but it again suffers from all the common Walking with Dinosaur pterosaur issues. However, something that I need to correct from my previous reviews of Walking with Dinosaurs pterosaurs is the question of how pointed the wing tips of the animals should be. In previous episodes, I've said how the tips look far too pointy at the ends and that they should instead be rounded, but this is actually something that's been the subject of some discussion among paleontologists. Although a lot of modern pterosaur paleo art illustrates them as having particularly round tips, this seems to stem from a slight misinterpretation of a paper investigating how pterosaur wings would have been shaped. This paper explains how having a sharply pointed wingtip is indeed quite implausible for these animals, as it results in something called tip stall. Basically, a sudden loss of lift is quite likely to happen at some point when flying. Evidence from the wingtip fingers of pterosaurs, the distal phalanges of digit 4, show that many of them would have had front edges of the wings that curved backwards slightly. This is, of course, excluding species such as Bellibrunus, which bizarrely have wingtips that point forwards, making things even more complicated but most pterosaurs would have had a curved leading edge, and then the wing membrane was likely quite straight going from the tip along the wing bones towards the body, and apparently wouldn't have had a bulging lobe on the back edge, as some reconstructions show. It also needs to be pointed out that pterosaur wings were very dynamic structures, with the fibres making up the soft tissues of the wings being able to change the shape of the overall wings as they flew, so at some angles when flying they could still have looked quite pointed at the ends. All of this is to say, though, that essentially it's not quite as clear-cut as I had once thought before, and more research could definitely be done on what exactly these wings looked like in life, and how exactly their shapes changed as they flew. But it still looks as though many of the Walking with Dinosaurs pterosaur designs have wingtips that are a bit too pointy, and clearly our understanding of how these animals looked has moved on since the 90s, and continues to change even today. Also featured in this episode is the mammal Steropodon, which, as I mentioned earlier, is live-acted by Kawati Mundi. Considering that Steropodon is an early monotreme, the group containing the platypus and echidnas, while Kawati Mundis are carnivorans from the Americas related to raccoons, this seems like an odd decision for a representative living mammal. The name of the mammal isn't actually given in the episode, but online and in the accompanying books, it is confirmed to be Steropodon, an ancient monotreme, the egg-laying mammals, discovered in a formation in New South Wales and named in 1985. Amazingly, it was actually the first ever Mesozoic mammal to be named from Australia, but dates back to between 100 and 96.6 million years ago, so is slightly too young for this episode. Only a single fossil is known for this mammal, an opalized jaw fragment containing three teeth, and at the time of its discovery, it extended the known fossil record of monotremes back in time by over 85 million years, so it was a very significant find. Walking with Dinosaurs accurately stresses how large Steropodon was for a mammal at this time, with this species representing one of the biggest Cretaceous mammals known. However, basically everything else about the depiction of this mammal is incorrect. Instead of looking like a modern Kawati Mundi, the monotreme Steropodon would have looked, you know, more like a monotreme. There are some conflicting reports on whether or not this animal would have possessed a platypus-like bill or beak, as a potentially closely related animal, Tinalophos, which is also the oldest and smallest known monotreme, has been found to lack such a structure by one paper, while another says it did actually have a bill. As pointed out by this latter paper though, an electrosensitive or mechanosensitive bill would indeed have been useful in the winter darkness of the polar forests, potentially acting as a selection pressure in the evolution of such structures. Modern reconstructions of Steropodon do show it looking much more platypus-like, and possessing a bill, and based on what we currently know this seems fairly reasonable, though more work could definitely be done on the life appearance of this animal. Of course, it doesn't help that the classification of Steropodon and its relatives is not fully sorted out yet. One thing is for certain though, and that's that the Walking with Dinosaurs design is definitely inaccurate, and if they were going to have anything live act this prehistoric monotreme, really they should have gone with a platypus. A tuatara is also seen very briefly in this episode, with Kenneth explaining that it's a relic from a time before dinosaurs that will manage to survive until long after them too, in New Zealand. This is somewhat accurate. Tuataras may look like a kind of lizard, but are in fact members of a completely different order of reptiles called the Rhynchocephalians. Only one living species remains today in New Zealand, despite the order once being very diverse in the Mesozoic. I'm not sure why the narration mentions that they lived long before the dinosaurs, considering that the earliest record of Rhynchocephalians only comes from the Mid-Triassic, while dinosaurs originated in the Late-Triassic. 
The idea that they are survivors from a long time ago, though, is fairly consistent with what we understand about Rhynchocephalian evolution, since they radiated mainly in the Triassic and Jurassic periods before becoming notably rarer in the Cretaceous, possibly due to competition with lizards. Interestingly though, they do seem to have managed to stay relatively abundant in the late Cretaceous of southernmost South America, where their fossils greatly outnumber those of lizards. Although there aren't fossil remains of Rhynchocephalians from the early Cretaceous of Australia itself, the discovery of jaws very similar to those of the living Tuatara from about 19 million years ago in New Zealand supports the idea that the Tuatara lineage was potentially present here since at least 80 to 60 million years ago, when New Zealand separated from Gondwana. So it's not completely unreasonable to assume that ancient members of the Tuatara lineage were around 106 million years ago in Australia too. However, the episode again has a live-acting animal to represent this creature, and literally just shows a modern Tuatara. Rhynchocephalians were remarkably diverse in appearance at the height of their radiation, and even in the Cretaceous when they started to become rarer, there were still forms that looked quite different to the living species, such as Priosphenodon from the late Cretaceous of Argentina. So I highly doubt a hypothetical early Cretaceous Australian representative of the group would have looked identical to the modern Tuatara. The Tuatara in this episode is also shown feeding on a giant weeter, a relative of crickets that are unique to New Zealand. Although it's another live-acted example of a prehistoric animal by a modern species, not much can be said about any differences in appearance considering that the fossils representing what might be Weta have not actually been described yet. They actually come from 190 million year old rocks in Queensland, making them early Jurassic in age, and technically have only been said to be members of Orthoptera, the larger order of insects containing Weta, grasshoppers, crickets, locusts, and relatives. So again, there's apparently no reported direct evidence of Weta in early Cretaceous Australia, but their presence can probably be inferred. The freezing behaviour is a cool detail to include, with certain species of Weta indeed being capable of withstanding temperatures down to minus 10 degrees Celsius. Whether this would also have been the case in prehistoric Weta is of course entirely speculative, but would definitely be a useful adaptation for surviving the cold winter months of the early Cretaceous polar forests. So there we have it, every single animal included in Spirits of the Ice Forest. But one of the most important parts of the whole episode is the environment in which it's set, an interesting habitat to show these animals living in. So what do we know about the climate and environment of the early Cretaceous South Pole? Well, there were definitely forests present here, with fossilised wood having been found that confirms the presence of both evergreen and deciduous plants, including cycads, ferns, ginkgos, conifers and others. The average global temperature of the Mesozoic was much higher than it is today, and so despite being within the Antarctic Circle, the dinosaurs of southern Australia wouldn't have experienced quite as low temperatures as those found below the circle today. The question of how low these temperatures got is something of a contested subject. The presence of a diverse plant community in southern Victoria at this time suggested to researchers that there couldn't have been any widespread freezing at this paleo latitude. However, others have since argued that the plant matter might only represent summers, instead of a year-round community. Although the exact location of this episode isn't entirely clear, with the episode stating Antarctica but then featuring loads of Australian dinosaurs, we can assume it's meant to be mostly based on Dinosaur Cove in Victoria, which puts it in the Umarala Formation. Evidence of frozen ground has been discovered in the Wonthaggy Formation, which is also exposed in Victoria and is somewhat equivalent to the Umarala Formation, and so an argument can definitely be made that parts of the landscape would have become frozen over during winter, as depicted in the episode. Additionally, possible evidence of glaciation might have been found in early Cretaceous rocks from southern Australia, and though it's not certain, it could be more indication that freezing temperatures did indeed occur at this time. So to sum up, it's controversial and still being researched, but there is some supporting evidence for what's shown in Walking with Dinosaurs. There's no doubt though that the inhabitants of this region of the planet would have had to endure months of total darkness, and the episode shows this brilliantly. Spirits of the Ice Forest is another fantastic episode of Walking with Dinosaurs. The idea to show life in this extreme and unusual environment was quite a brave one, with such limited material from these animals making it quite a challenge. It might also be the episodes that's held up most in terms of scientific accuracy over 20 years later, but again I think that might be due to the fact that not a lot has changed in our understanding of the specific dinosaurs featured in the episode, at least compared to other animals. Of course, the description of Australovenator gives a completely different look to the polar allosaur, but not a whole lot has really been done on Mutabarasaurus, Lielanosaurus, or Coolosuchus in the years since the episode aired. This is a shame considering how unique these creatures are, especially for the environment in which they lived, but also makes sense given how difficult their fossils are to find. 
The story of this episode, again focusing on a specific group of animals, really draws you into the world and gives a good impression of how tough life would have been in this strange environment, with the losses that the Lielanosaurus experience making you feel sorry for these adorable little dinosaurs. I also have to praise the inclusion of Coolasuchus again, as Temnospondyls really deserve some more love, and featuring this creature in the episode made it an instantly iconic prehistoric animal. As in every episode, the music is phenomenal. Ben Bartlett really didn't have to go this hard with the Walking Dinosaurs score, but it's a great thing that he did, and listening to the music as I write these reviews is honestly one of my favourite things about making these videos. The score for this episode is absolutely haunting at times, while still capturing the beauty of the prehistoric world and the unforgiving conditions of this part of the planet. I think Departure of the Mutabarasaurus has to be my favourite piece from this episode. It's so grand but tragic at the same time and fits perfectly with the scene of these mighty dinosaurs beginning their long journey once more. So it's another brilliant and iconic episode of this fantastic show, and I hope you've enjoyed seeing how much our understanding of polar dinosaurs has changed in the years since it was created. I must also apologise for the very long delay in making this video, but to make up for it you won't have to wait long for the next one, trust me. And there sure is a lot to say about the accuracies and inaccuracies of the last episode, especially that T-Rex. Anyway, thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.